welcome to our Frontiers in Physics seminar. Uh, my name is Dr. Megan Gray, and I am one of the lecturers on the Frontiers in Physics um, course. Right, so today I'm really delighted uh, that our inaugural Frontiers seminar this year will be by our very own Professor Ed Copeland. Ed is an expert in all things cosmology, and I can't think of a better person that to take us on a tour of the state of our universe. So uh, at this point, it's my pl great pleasure to hand over to Ed, who is going to tell us about the state of our universe. So Ed, go ahead, unmute yourself and share your screen. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Megan. Um, hello, everybody. I kind of feel like I'm representing um, all the staff and the faculty in the department in welcoming you to this uh, first lecture. This is an image. This is your universe. This is your observable universe as it was roughly 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, given that the universe is about 13.8 billion years old now, this is in the, you know, the opening moments of the universe's evolution. And what you're seeing here in these sort of orange and blue spots are slight ripples, slight fluctuations in temperature of about 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin, right? Kelvin, um, above or below the mean temperature of about 2.7 degrees Kelvin, which is what our background radiation is. And this is going to play a big role. This background radiation is a remnant of the hot Big Bang, the early universe radiation which gradually cooled and crucially it didn't cool smoothly it had small bits of the universe where it cooled more rapidly than other bits and because of that that allowed structures to form it allowed us to be here so all that you need for today all i'm asking of you is an imagination i hope by the end of uh, this next 45 minutes or so to have demonstrated that there is a link between events which occurred in the first fractions of a second after the Big Bang and the universe we see today over 13.8 billion years later. Here's our place in the universe. Let's discuss that. I want to just tell you about some of the length scales, remind you of some of the length scales. So let's begin with the Earth. And the Earth's about 12 kilometers across. And it, when I was putting this together, I realized I'm in this picture. I'm there somewhere. Now, if you look really closely, I think you can just see a lad about eight years old playing football, but you really got to look very closely for that. So our sun, we're protected by the sun, which of course is a star. And the sun's diameter is, we're now long, no longer 12,000 kilometers, we're about one and a half million kilometers, with the typical distance between the earth and the sun being about 150 million kilometers. And the sun is protecting us, but it's also protecting a whole series of other planets which form our solar system. I'm afraid I can't let Pluto go. I love Pluto. It's been, I grew up with Pluto. Pluto and I are very good friends. So it remains in my little solar system, even though officially it isn't there. But the sun-Pluto distance is about 5.96 billion kilometers of order 40 astronomical units. So our sun, a star, is a star within our galaxy, and our galaxy, of course, is the Milky Way. And our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, but we can't see the spirals because we live in it. And so up to the right of this image here, you see a, a, a different beautiful spiral galaxy, the Whirlpool Galaxy. We actually live towards the edge of one of the spiral arms, and the typical scales that we're now moving into, we have, they're getting, getting so big, we have to introduce some new units. And so we introduced the unit of a light year, the distance light travels in one year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. And the typical diameter of the galaxy is about 100,000 light years. And a galaxy contains of order 200 billion other stars, typically. So we live in a galaxy and we live in a universe filled with galaxies. We estimate there are of order at least 200 billion galaxies in the universe, in the, the, the observable universe. And this is an example of containing many galaxies. It's the deepest picture ever taken in the universe by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's called the deep field image of, the, of our universe. And there are, there are blue dots in here, 
which are looking back over 11 billion years. You're seeing the light as they were emitted from objects 11 billion years ago. What you get in astronomy is not only a look at the distant scales, but you get a look in this, into, the, into the past. You get to see things as they were when they were formed. And so you have an, a, a, a beautiful way of seeing things evolve simply by looking at the light that's coming from them at different distances. So what about the theory that went into understanding how our universe is? Well, the, the current favorite theory, the one that fits the data the best, was introduced in 1915 by Albert Einstein, his general theory of relativity. His theory, just a set of complicated theory of, of nonlinear differential equations, the beauty of it was that it inter, inter, intimately connected the matter content in the universe with the geometry. So the shape of the universe was affected by the matter content in the universe. People began to start exploring his equations almost immediately. And of course, well, I don't know if you might not be aware, one of the most famous solutions that was, was obtained was obtained by Karl Schwarzschild, who, who obtained it in the trenches in the First World War, a German physicist, mathematician. And it was in around 1916 that he obtained the solution that became known as the Schwarzschild black hole. He obtained, he solved Einstein's equations to give you a black hole solution. He did that in the trenches. But a few people like Alexander Friedman and Albert and um, Lemaitre, they started thinking about cosmology. They started applying Einstein's theory to cosmology, to the largest features on our universe. And it led them to this amazing conclusion that the universe had to be non-static, it had to be evolving, it had to be either growing or shrinking. Not only that, Einstein's theories, actually, and Einstein realized this early on, predicted the existence of massless gravitational waves, the analog of electromagnetic waves that we see today. These gravitational waves corresponded to the ripples of the space-time with which our universe was made. He didn't think there'd be any chance of them being detected. But just a few years ago in 2015, I think it was, or 2016, they were detected, directly detected for the first time by the LIGO gravitational wave detectors at Hanford and Livingston. And it led to the, 19, to the 2017 Nobel Prize for the chief people involved in it. But for you and I, the, the phenomenal aspect is it has opened up a brand new window on cosmology. Let's go back to Albert and his view on the expanding universe. He hated Lemaitre's calculation. He said to him, your calculations are correct, but your physics is atrocious. After all, he just knew about the Milky Way. In the Milky Way, the stars don't move apart. Every night, the stars are in the same relative position to us. So he decided, he, he accepted the calculations, but said the physics isn't right. So what he did was he modified his calculations. But it, by introducing this extra term called the cosmological constant, it allowed him to have a static universe, a universe that wasn't evolving. But it was unstable. And in May 1930, um, Eddington showed that Einstein's solution was unstable. Another neat thing is that in June, on June the 6th, 1930, he came to visit Nottingham to give a lecture. He gave it in German. He arrived two hours late. And I can't believe anybody understood it. You definitely got to go and see the blackboard and see the fantastic writing. Somebody had the wonderful intuition of thinking, I know what, let's get him to sign this blackboard. And it, for me, it's fun to think that he arrived here on June the 6th. It was May that Eddington showed that his theory was unstable. And I can't help but thinking he must have been pretty bothered by that. And I think if you look closely at that photograph, you think, yeah, he's smiling, but deep down, he's, he's hurting. He doesn't like this expanding universe. He had to give in to the fact that it was expanding when in 1929, Edwin Hubble demonstrated conclusively that the universe that distant galaxies were actually moving apart. These distant galaxies were actually receding from, from us with a, a speed of velocity which was proportional to their distance. This confirmed a prediction of Lemaitre actually in his equations. Lemaitre predicted this would happen, but it's known as Hubble's law. 
This kind of marked the start of modern observational cosmology. Now the universe was expanding. There was no need for Einstein's cosmological constant term. And he's, he's, he's quoted as saying it was the sort of the biggest mistake he made. The ex so the scenario was simple. We had an expanding universe. It was slowing down because gravity sucks, right? We all know gravity sucks, it slows you down. And the universe was full of what we'll, we'll come on to discuss, mainly cold dark matter. Matter that's non-relativistic, it moves very slowly and it just clumps together. But actually towards the, this is how science works. You begin to probe things a little bit more. And in the early 1990s, a survey of about 2 million galaxies known as the APM survey, they looked at the correlation between the galaxies. You pick a galaxy and you ask, how likely is it that there's another galaxy nearby? And, and then you can build up a, a correlation of those. And it suggested that all wasn't so clear. The galaxies were clustered in a way which seemed to be inconsistent with a universe that was just made up of cold dark matter. It began to look like there needed to be this lambda term, this cosmological constant term once again in there. And one of the first people to realize this and to make use of it was Jim Peebles. And Jim Peebles, a brilliant cosmologist, was awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize for his discoveries in physical cosmology. So the universe is, is expanding and then in, and it began to look like we needed this cosmological constant term. And in 1998, it was, it was finally confirmed. The universe was not only expanding, it wasn't decelerating, it was not slowing down, it was accelerating. Something was causing the galaxies to move apart even faster the further out they were. And this we've, we've become dubbed as dark energy, basically because we don't know what it is. And it could be a cosmological constant, but as you will see, if it is the cosmological constant, we don't really know why it's got the value it has. Back to the universe. The universe is full of radiation today, and it's, the, it's a remnant of this hot Big Bang radiation that was there. And a prediction of the hot Big Bang that it should be, is that it should be a perfect black body. It's thermal radiation, and that it cools down as the universe expands. And it cools down so that the temperature is effectively one over the size of the universe. So as the universe gets bigger, the temperature drops. And the prediction of the hot Big Bang is that this temperature should have been about of order 3 Kelvin today. Remember, water freezes at 273 Kelvin. Our universe is really cold. The COBE satellite of 1992, which was sent up to probe for this radiation and probe for those fluctuations in the radiation, found that it had a temperature of 2.728 Kelvin plus or minus 0 0.004. This is the data from the COBE satellite. The, there's no error bars you can see there. That's because there are error bars, but they're, they're narrower than the width of the line. It's the most beautiful plot, I think, showing you the perfect black body radiation, as, radiation associated with our um, universe. Now we've talked about the very large, and I feel that I really need to tell you about the very small as well, because that's going to be very important in linking the two together. So what are we made of? Well, the stuff we're made of is represented by some of the standard model of particle physics. And the standard model has what are known as your fermions. These are the quarks and the leptons and your bosons, the force carriers. So we've got the, the fermions, which are providing you with the things that make that matter is made of and the bosons, which are telling us about the interactions between the matter. So that you can see three families of quarks and leptons here. One of the big unanswered questions in the world of particle physics is why are there three generations? Why does it stop there? Another of these is why do the various particles, which have very similar properties, have such different masses? The electron and the muon and the tau have completely different mass scales associated with them. So you have the particles that we're made of, and then we have the force carriers, which tell us about the interactions between these particles. And then, of course, we have the antiparticles on top of these. Let me just move on a little bit to describe sort of where these are enter into the world of cosmology. So when did the first nuclei form? This is the world of nuclear synthesis. In the very early universe, everything was too hot and energetic for, for nuclei, for the, for the quarks to begin to combine to give me nuclei. But as the universe cooled down, then it became possible for these first nuclei to form. And by the end of the first three minutes or so, then we managed to have hydrogen forming 
which has just got a proton in there with two ups and a down quark. And then slowly but surely, helium could then form afterwards. And hydrogen and helium, they, these are the two lightest elements, and they make up, hydrogen makes up about 75% about by mass of the visible universe. Helium makes up about 24%. The 1% that's left is made of everything else that we can see. That's amazing, right? And then the stuff that you and I are made of, the protons, the neutrons, the electrons, they come from just the first row, the first column of the standard model, the up and down quark, right? The other ones don't make up the stuff we're made of, and yet they're integral to the world of the standard model. So why? why who, who ordered these extra stuff? And it makes up just 5% of the total energy density of our universe. What about the heavier elements? What about the carbon, the oxygen, the nitrogen? Well, these are all made in stars. These, these rely on stars exploding for, to release those elements that can be made. And so in many ways, you really are stardust. Let me just explain briefly the idea then, as I, before I go on to talk about the expansion of our universe a bit more, the model explaining the universe's evolution, the kind of the, the Big Bang. There are various assumptions that go into the Big Bang, and it's one, one of the key ones is one that Einstein himself introduced. And that is on the largest possible scales that we can see in the universe. It looks homogeneous and it looks isotropic. And what I mean by that, a homogeneous universe is a universe that looks, you, you are in no unique place. It looks the same on average wherever you are in that universe. And an isotropic universe looks the same in all directions. There is no particular directional dependence in the universe. Given that and the, the initial conditions, which is some sort of big bang, which we don't know what banged, the universe is expanding with the velocities of recession proportional to the separation that comes out from the equations, as Lemaitre showed. The lightest nuclei, nuclear synthesis, occurs within the first few minutes. We end up with a universe bathed in radiation with a temperature today of order three degrees, of three Kelvin. And the universe is old and large. And crucially, in the early universe, it cannot have been totally homogeneous and isotropic. A universe that was totally homogeneous and isotropic could not form any structures. How would, it, how would they have known where to collapse? So there had to be some sort of small irregularities in this universe generated by something like ripples on a beautifully flat pond as you get, if you, as you magnify and magnify and magnify, you get closer to the surface of that pond, you begin to see those ripples. The same is true of the space time of our universe. It had to have some small irregularities on it. And given those irregularities, once we'd sorted them out, the development of structure can be explained through gravitational collapse. So how can you tell how much matter there is out there? I mean, you don't have a tape measure. You can't go and get a weighing scales. All that you have to look at is light coming to you. What, what do we do? We use the fact that Einstein showed as well, actually Newton showed us as well, that light gets bent by massive objects. For example, clusters of galaxies will bend light. And by determining the, the amount of light, how much it's bent by, we can determine the mass of the cluster. And as a result of this, and then as a result of using numerical simulations, for example, using um, general relativity, we can, come to the conclusion that actually that we're only made up of 5%, as I said, but there's a stuff called dark matter, which makes up about 25% of the energy content of our universe. And it's dark because it doesn't seem to interact electromagnetically. But what and where is the dark matter? It remains one of the big pressing questions we have in cosmology. It could be, and we believe it's some sort of heavy or light particle that probably doesn't decay. And the favored candidates were called WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. And when they built the LHC, believe it or not, one of the main reasons for building the LHC was to find the Higgs. The second main reason was to find a symmetry called supersymmetry. And as a byproduct of a supersymmetry, we'd get WIMPs. We'd solve everything. We'd solve the dark matter. The LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, has turned up the Higgs, but no WIMP. No, exact, no evidence for supersymmetry. We've got indirect evidence for dark matter though, right? We can look out into the universe and look at the clusters of galaxies colliding, and we can see what happens to the light coming from those clusters. And we see evidence that the, uh, when two clusters of galaxies collide, 
the ordinary matter, the baryons interact with each other in the center of the collision re region, but the dark matter goes past, straight past through each other because it hardly interacts. And the right hand picture here are contours of mass density. So you can hopefully see these like mountain tops, which we believe are the concentrated regions of the dark matter associated with the two clusters that have passed through each other. And this type of thing provides indirect evidence for, the, for dark matter. So knowing the energy content of the universe is important in order to understand the geometry of the universe. So the geometry of the universe, Einstein's theory, which suggests that the universe on large scales is homogeneous and isotropic, can have three types of geometry. One is this closed or, or sphere shape that you can see. The middle one is the hyperboloid and the flat is the flat, what looks like a sheet. And each, whether each one determines on the energy content of the universe, sort of given by this parameter omega. And the universe seems to suggest, the evidence seems to suggest that omega is very close to unity today, that our universe is consistent with being spatially flat. So you think, OK, great, that's fantastic. Well done. Let's tick that off. It's not fantastic. It's a problem. So why is it a problem? If you take Einstein's theory, is equations of motion and evolve them for 13.8 billion years and say at the end of 13.8 billion years, the universe looks very flat. And you ask how flat must the universe have been, say, a second after the Big Bang, when I was telling you that's when the nuclei begin to form. That's the bottom of the screen there is how close to unity Omega had to be. Enter the final part, inflation. The idea that in our very early universe, we had a tiny causally connected region which was in thermal contact. Remember the universe on these very large scales is, is at the same temperature. If in the very un early universe we had this very small patch in thermal contact, something caused it to inflate rapidly. The space expanded by at least a billion, billion, billion times, 10 to the power 27 in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. I pause for a moment. It expanded by a factor of 10 to the 27 in 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So that causally connected region became huge and easily encompassed our patch of the universe, which was of order the size of a grapefruit at the end of inflation. And that explains why the universe is so homogeneous and so isotropic. And it also explains why the universe is so flat. The universe looks flat because it has been stretched out so much, even though it might not be flat on the very largest scales. To us, it's, it looks flat and that explains why after one second it would have been so close to be in unity, that omega parameter. And moreover, the thing that generated the inflation is known as the inflaton field, a scalar field that many of you will become very familiar with over the course of your degree. These scalar fields, of course, are driven by quantum mechanics. We're all really driven by quantum mechanics. And the quantum fluctuations of these scalar fields actually is the thing that generates the anisotropies in the universe because they couple to the space-time geometry of our universe. And so different regions of the universe have slightly different values of the scalar field. And so you have slightly different values of the, of the, of the, ge of the geometry in that region. And that's what we can predict. And you can then constrain your theories of inflation by looking at that data. And so finally today, what is making the universe accelerate? We've got dark energy, which is this some weird form of energy that exists, seems to exist in empty space everywhere. It pervades our universe. It's smoothly distributed. We see no evidence that it clusters. It seems to have a constant density, a constant mass energy per unit volume or at best it's varying very slowly. It doesn't seem to interact with ordinary matter, only gravity, or if it does interact with ordinary matter, very weakly. But there's a big problem. When you try and estimate how much you expect there to be in this vacuum energy from the quantum world, then you expect there to be way more of this vacuum energy than we see. So where is it? What's happened to it? What's happened to those quantum fluctuations? They've been hidden some, some way. And so we finish. Here's the inventory of our, of our universe, the current state of it. About 70% of the energy density is in dark energy. We don't know what it is. 25% is in dark matter. We don't know what it is. 
but 5% we've got cracked, except we don't know where the standard model really fits in the world of particle physics, what a fundamental theory would have the standard model. So gravity and the standard model works well, but there are many issues that remain to be resolved.